Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm excited to introduce two speakers that we have um, who are going to talk to us about some of the work they've been doing in urban agriculture. Um, so I crossed paths with Gail again as I was organizing a symposium for our last entomology meeting um, where we were focusing on entomology in urban agriculture. Um, and we have a lot of overlapping interests with Michael and Gail and myself and my grad student Katie in terms of black soldier fly um, composting and its application in urban farms. Um, so we are going to have a joint presentation from Dr. Gail Langelato, who is a professor at um, Oregon State University, and she also runs the statewide Master Gardener program. And uh, Michael Nelson, who was a master's student and has since moved on to become an instructor and is developing curriculum and course material for the urban ag program at OSU. So thank you both so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation um, and I will help um, foster questions. And, and um, if we have any that pop up, I might briefly interrupt depending on, on what the question is. But Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for inviting us to be here today. And thanks everyone who's here to learn a little bit more about um, this kind of somewhat off the wall topic of insect husbandry as a form of urban agriculture. Today, our talk is going to be broken into three main sections. I'm going to give an overview of urban agriculture overall, some of the barriers, some of the opportunities in urban agriculture today. And then we're going to launch into three case studies of insect husbandry as urban agriculture. I'm going to cover the first two parts, um, looking at the production of biological control agents and mason bees. And Michael's going to finish us up by talking about his experiences rearing black soldier fly and as well as um, tying it all together with some of the summary of key issues and opportunities in urban agriculture. So I'll jump right into the overview. Urban agriculture can be defined as the production, but also the processing and marketing of food, flowers, fiber, feed, or herbs, usually on land, but also on water, dispersed throughout urban and peri-urban areas. Now that's a really broad definition of urban agriculture that also encompasses a broad array of urban agriculture incarnations, if you will. Urban agriculture can be conducted at the residential, the community, or the commercial scale. The intentions or motivations for participating in urban agriculture can span from recreational to social justice to entrepreneurial motivations. Urban agriculture can occur outdoors in soil or containers or indoors in high tech environments in soilless media as controlled environment agriculture. So given the broad definition of urban agriculture, as well as long term pronouncements related to the importance of commercial scale urban agriculture to local food systems, I think it's important to point out that the vast majority of urban agriculture in those cities that have been studied are decidedly at the residential and the community scale. So here we have um, maps of two cities, Chicago on the left and Portland to the bottom right. And using Google Earth imagery, high resolution Google Earth imagery, um, Taylor and Lavelle in Chicago and Nathan McClintock in Portland, Oregon, went through and counted every square looking plot of garden, uh, which they presume to be an urban agriculture food producing garden and individually counted up those small plots. In Chicago, Taylor and Lavelle counted almost 4,500 different small plots of um, what they presumed to be vegetable production, which added up together equaled 51 acres of food production land in the city of Chicago. In Portland, Oregon, uh, Nathan McClintock conservatively estimated that there are about 3,000 urban agriculture plots, which added together, he conservatively estimated uh, is akin to 20 acres of production space. 
Uh, Nathan McClintock did note, however, that the big, uh, the profusion of tree canopy cover in Portland, Oregon really made it difficult for him to count all of these plots. So he noted that this is drastically an underestimate. I think it's important to note that uh, commercial farms were also counted in these and other studies in Portland, Oregon, for example, whereas there was a conservative estimate of 3000 residential scale urban agricultural sites. There are in any given year only between five and 10 commercial scale urban agricultural endeavors. And several of these are oftentimes organized as nonprofits or include ornamental plant nurseries as well. So we can ask why there are so few commercial urban farms given um, the popularity of urban agriculture. And as I said, long-term pronouncements that commercial scale urban agriculture really is an opportunity. It really comes down to the cost, the cost of land, the cost of utilities, the cost of labor in urban areas is more expensive and oftentimes substantially more expensive than in comparable rural areas. So here are a couple of photos from Black Futures Farm, which is an urban farm in southeast Portland, Oregon. Black Futures Farm came to be because um, farmers went through a farmer training program that was co-organized between OSU Extension and the Veterans Administration. When they graduated from that training farm on incubator farm space, they were looking for land and they couldn't find any land. They couldn't afford land. It's very expensive in Portland, Oregon. They eventually landed on land that was being managed by the horticulture extension agent in Portland, Oregon, who let them have um, several acres of land that he had been using as a teaching and demonstration farm. But that land itself isn't even under the ownership of OSU or the extension agent. That land itself is actually owned by Portland Public School Systems. I point this out because there's just kind of the tenuous nature of urban farmer farming that in many cases you're farming on borrowed space where your access to that space might change at a moment's notice. Another example that I wanted to share was um, vertical harvest in Jackson, Wyoming. Uh, vertical, harvest, vertical harvest is a high-tech indoor farm that was established in a former parking garage in Jackson, Wyoming. Uh, the conversion of the parking garage to an indoor grow space was funded by donations and grants. Uh, Vertical Harvest itself is organized as a nonprofit, which um, reduces or eliminates its tax burden. And they also keep labor costs low by classifying their employment model as a job training program for underemployed individuals. So even though both um, Black Futures Farm and Vertical Harvest engage in entrepreneurial commercial scale activities by selling their produce to local restaurants and to local residents. Um, there, there are still a lot of factors in place which put them more on the nonprofit end of the scale. And that is because it really is difficult to succeed and compete with uh, conventional scale, more rural agriculture um, at comparable scales, where commercial urban agriculture does succeed, tends to be niche markets that are not currently served by conventional agriculture. One of my favorite examples in Oregon are culturally relevant vegetables. I don't know if you've ever been to Oregon before, but it's a fairly homogenous population. Not a lot of cultural diversity here, um, much to my dismay because I am half Filipino and grew up in a household where we regularly ate things such as opo squash, camote leaves, which are just sweet potato leaves and really easy to grow and delicious. I don't know why more people don't grow them and bitter melon as well. If I want to buy these vegetables um, where I live in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, I have to drive several hours to the outskirts of um, Seattle to reliably be able to find all of these things. Or sometimes I can get lucky and find one or two in a grocery store in the outskirts of Portland, Oregon. 
We think that insect husbandry represents another form of urban agriculture that is poised for commercial success. I mean, you can't really get more niche than insect husbandry. And there is research that shows that folks in urban areas do have a high willingness to pay, particularly for the ecosystem services that can be provided by insects. And the definition of insect husbandry itself is the rearing of insects for human food, fuel, animal feed, or ecosystem services, including the services of pollination, biological control, or waste decomposition. And this idea of insect husbandry as urban agriculture really is not new. Urban beehives in particular have been very popular for the last couple of decades. And some people have been able to turn that popularity into commercial success. In the middle of the slide here is a photo of the owner of Bee Local. Bee Local is a company that puts honey beehives on the tops of Portland area restaurants and hotels. Um, they're paid for that service so that the hotel or restaurant can advertise their eco forwardness or their eco friendliness. Um, some people might call this an instance of bee washing, suggesting that you're doing a lot to save the bees, whereas honeybees are a non native species that some people would argue don't need a lot of saving. Um, they also sell the honey that they harvest back to the restaurant or the hotel for use as a hyper local ingredient in mixed drinks or in meals. They also partnered with Jacobson Salt Company um, to produce a line of honeys, which they market as, as embodying the terroir of whatever area those hives were placed upon. So much like winemakers market the terroir of their specific vines, um, urban agriculturalists producing honey in urban areas, at least be local, are also marketing the terroir of their honey. One of the reasons that we think that insect husbandry has a lot of promise in urban agriculture besides the niche of uh, the practice itself is because compared to other types of urban agriculture, insect husbandry has relatively low startup cost and low barriers to entry. We're going to go over three examples of insect husbandry as urban agriculture. I'm going to talk about biological control agents and mason bees. And as I mentioned, Michael is going to finish us up with black soldier fly. The production of biological control agents for augmentative releases represents a particularly lucrative market of insect husbandry as urban ag. For example, a 2004 study by Jetter and Payne found that consumers were willing to pay 21 times more for biological control of landscape pests compared to a pesticide only option. Now, I think it's important to point out that not all homeowners and not all landlords are going to want to pay for the more environmentally friendly but substantially more expensive option. But at least in our region in the Pacific Northwest, uh, we have found that landscape management companies tend to have the most success when they partner with HOAs that consider and advertise ecological land management as a community amenity. And where do these companies buy their biological control agents? Well, if they're in the Portland metro region or really anywhere in the Willamette Valley, there is a single vendor of biological control agents where you can buy them for augmentative releases. And throughout the state of Oregon, there are only two producers of biological control agents for the entire state, one in the north outside of Portland and one in the south outside of Medford most areas of the state and really most areas of the country don't have a local biological control producer outside of Southern California. And I do want to note that this particular map, um, we made it by going through the fact sheet produced by Jen White in 2010 out of the University of Kentucky, looking up all of the vendors that they had listed in that publication and um, marking out which ones were still in business as well as adding others that we knew um, had entered the market. 
you know, and it really, at least in our area, we see that biological control for the greenhouse industry is a really growing market. The popularity of CBD oil from hemp, as well as the legalization of medical and recreational cannabis, the decriminalization of small amounts of cannabis as well. We're seeing a need um, from large players in the market but also with folks that are growing at the home scale as well. If you're a larger player in this market, or you've been in this market, or any greenhouse market, such as the production of ornamental plants for quite some time, um, usually those companies allocate one or more greenhouse bays for in-house production of um, biological control agents to control common greenhouse pests, such as thrips or spider mites. However, smaller players in households don't have the space to allocate an entire bay for the production of biological control agents. And the quantities that are currently sold on the open market are too large of a quantity for what their needs are. Many times these smaller growers try to uh, coordinate orders across to businesses so that they are not wasting money by buying more than they need. So even though we see a lot of promise for small space rearing of biological control agents, um, there's a lot of promise. You don't need a lot of space, a lot of specialized equipment. It is important to note that this is complicated by the general need to rear three trophic levels just so you can sell one. And so that's why the organisms that are most uh, suited for insect husbandry in urban spaces tend to be those that will oviposit on artificial substrate and or those that will accept substitute host or substitute prey. Minute pirate bugs are one example of this generalist predator um, that will oviposit um, promiscuously, if you will, and will accept a wide array of prey. Uh, they're oftentimes known as minute pirate bugs, insidious flower bugs. They are very effective predators of thrips and other greenhouse pests, and they only take about three weeks to go from eggs to adult. They will oviposit in substrates such as green beans, and they will accept substitute prey, including meal moth eggs. Um, meal moth eggs, if you've ever had an old container of bean soup mix, or if you've ever had rice or flour, uh, perhaps you have found meal moths um, uh, in uh, containers long left undiscovered or long uh, forgotten in the pantry. They're a really good source of protein for aureus and other generalist predators. Uh, they've been used to rear a wide array of generalist biological control agents, including generalist parasitoids, and they can be reared on a diverse array of cheap diets, like I said, including um, grains, dog food. And so this kind of takes away the issue of needing to rear three trophic levels to sell two, uh, to sell one. If you use meal moth eggs in the aureus system, you're rearing two organisms, the meal moths and the aureus, to sell one, the aureus. They're incredibly fecund. One female can lay 400 eggs, so you don't need a lot of space as well to uh, rear out the meal moth eggs. Bueno and colleagues in 2006 worked out a small scale low tech system for rearing aureus in glass jars. Really, you need to have a warm and humid environment, about 26 degrees Celsius and 70% uh, relative humidity. This does not need to be a grow chamber, control chamber. You can just allocate a small closet that is kept warm or a small room which is kept warm and humid um, for successful rearing. A 12-12 light dart cycle, uh, you can put the lights on a timer. It takes about 20 days uh, to go from egg to adult. Throwing, you use one set of jars for oviposition and another set of jars for rearing out the adults for sale. And the general system itself are just um, kind of medium sized glass jars. You throw some cardboard strips in there to give the aureus some retreat spaces or some resting spaces. The green beans are the oviposition substrate. 
The Mediterranean meal moth eggs are the substitute prey for the aureus. Uh, have an open lid with some veil fabric for air exchange. And uh, with about three of these jars for rearing, you can produce enough aureus that is currently sold on the open market today for about $45. So not a lot of specialized equipment and not a lot of space needed either. Going to switch to mason bees. Um, mason bee, our native mason bee, Osmia lignaria or blue orchard bee, sometimes called bobs, are the most popular mason bee for trail or for, sa uh, for sale or for trade. These mason bees will nest in pre-existing cavities where they will put uh, their little balls of nectar and pollen and lay the egg, which will hatch out as larvae feeding on these provisions. They put divisions between their larval chambers with mud, uh, which they gather from wherever they're foraging. They're great bees because they're non-aggressive and they're active at cooler temperatures. This makes them really effective pollinators of early season crops in particular, such as almonds and or cherries. Over the past couple of years, they've actually become a popular garden pet for hobbyists. We have several master gardener groups that used to pre-pandemic have mason bee parties, where at the end of every season, they would gather to clean their cocoons and sort their cocoons and talk about mason bees. Um, there is some true love for mason bees out there with some of the gardeners that I work with. It can also be a... Um, uh, a successful urban market or an open uh, urban market for insect husbandry. Here we have an example of a Seattle-based company that will sell you a mason bee kit for $60. You set it up in your garden. At the end of the season, they will collect and clean your cocoons and then they'll replenish them the following season, but they'll hold back some of your cocoons that they sell to orchardists. So they have two revenue streams going on, one from the sale of the mason bee kits to the homeowners and one for the sale of the cocoons to commercial orchardists. However, some of the problems that we're seeing with this system is that Osmia cornifrons, which is a non-native bee, is being sold or traded, um, maybe not explicitly by saying they're native mason bees, but they're certainly not telling homeowners that um, this is a non-native species that, might, um, that we might be giving you. And then even once you set up your own mason bee house, if you have a mason bee house or mason bee straws, once those nesting blocks or straws are up, you really can't control who's going to come and colonize those spaces. Is it the native lignaria or is it the non-native cornifrons? Here I have a photo as well as a quote from one of the master gardeners that I work with letting me know that they entered the mason bee trade about three or four years ago, starting out with 200 cocoons. Now they have a business where they're selling to California almond growers for, um, for pollination services. When she broke open her nesting block, she noted that she saw the larger brown um, cocoons of lignaria, but she also noted the smaller um, whiter cocoons, which are characteristic of cornifrons. She wanted to know what should she do with the 15,000 cocoons that she has that are a mix of native and non-natives. She already had a buyer in place. And honestly, I did not have great advice to give to her because there is no efficient mechanism for sorting the native from the non-native at this time. It, it can be done, but it takes a lot of time and it takes a person to do that. And so at least in the mid-Atlantic states of the Eastern United States, um, we know that native mason bees are in decline and non-native mason bees are increasing. Uh, this was documented very well by Catherine LaCroix and colleagues looking at the decline of six native species of mason bees in those area. 
and the annual rate of increase of a non-native mason bee, Osmia taurus in particular. They do have cornifrons in their system, um, but it doesn't seem to be increasing at a significantly positive rate relative to um, Osmia taurus. So we can ask what is the role of insect husbandry and the mason bee trade in the spread of um, non-native mason bees in the eastern U.S.? Uh, I don't know that that's been established, and we honestly don't even have a really good idea about the current extent and spread of non-native corner fronds in um, in our area in Oregon. However, reports I'm getting from the field from master gardeners and others suggest that um, corner fronds is well established in our area. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Michael to finish us up with me uh, with black soldier fly and to summarize our talk. Okay, all right. Thank you, Gail, for that introduction to why we believe insect husbandry is appropriate for the urban grower and that exploration of two potential insect uses, so both biocontrol and pollination services. I'm here to finish up adding our last suggestion for raising insects as livestock, or in this case, micro livestock, uh, animals raised for use or for profit. So the applications can be diverse but, diverse, but at its core, I'm talking about raising an insect species with the main focus being its, uh, on its diet and its weight gain. Now, of course, uh, artificial rearing tends to increase the incidence of both disease and it definitely increases the need for sanitation with the elevated density of the livestock. But still, there, um, there's many insect species under cultivation with the hope of a promising future as micro livestock. But um, let me first tell you about the fly that I chose that we all know um, what I'm talking about here. So it's black soldier fly or Hemetia lucens. It is classified as a mimic fly. It's apparently, um, it, it's thought to be posing as a mud dauber wasp. So we can see, uh, yeah, mimics mud dauber wasp. So we can see these translucent portions in its abdomen here, kind of mimicking that narrow waist that we see of wasps in general and this mud dauber wasp in particular, we see that um, the pinch of the waist there. Uh, we also see similarities like the light colored um, leg, the tips of the legs. We see that um, in both the mud dauber and the black soldier fly. And lastly, if we look at the fly, I'm uh, sorry, at the antenna, they also look um, pretty similar, unlike how I've seen other flies holding their antenna. So um, yes, yeah, so that's the description of the species in general. Um, it is considered a non-pest fly. Uh, they're typically not vectors for disease or contamination. Um, it's, it, it's best shown if we just examine the habits of the adults. So if we compare it to like a typical house fly, the house fly could land on your picnic food and then land on just some waste somewhere at the park and then land back on your food. And of course, you know, it's, it's the, this house fly is eating, it's, um, it's transferring by touch, uh, and just uh, acting as a potential vector for all sorts of disease and pathogens along the way. Whereas if we look at the adults of black soldier fly, they have a very low appetite. They aren't looking for the same things that's, that their larvae eat on. Mostly the adults um, sit around on plant material at, uh, most of the time. Sometimes they fly um, in order to pair and then land to finish mating. Um, but just in general, uh, Whereas the house fly is looking for food all the time, the, the black soldier fly instead is um, it's looking for organic waste for its grubs, for its larvae, but it is going to lay those eggs above and separate from the organic waste. So the, like uh, um, in most all circumstances, the adult fly is not landing on the waste. So even if it were to land on your food, it's highly unlikely to be bringing in any, um, any bad things. And then just again, we can see, you know, this translucent portion in the abdomen there. I just think it's really neat. I haven't seen on in um, most any other animals, like translucent, tra translucent wings, sure, but translucent body portions, uh, it's pretty interesting. Oh, with there, um, these flies were originally native to like kind of central South America region. They've since with world trade uh, established themselves well across the entire tropic regions and they expand out into the temperate zones um, as those various areas warm. And then of course recede back to the tropics as it cools. 
Oh, and then their um, life cycle. It's relatively simple and straightforward. So a mated adult female lays eggs, few hundred eggs per clutch, a handful of clutches per female. So um, really great numbers there, uh, really makes it easy to, to focus on having a lot of larvae, which is the real, the real aim here, the real harvestable product. So then we get neonates, which are born at about a millimeter in size. Um, and they grow through these various instars to reach about 25 millimeters or an inch in size and about a 10th of a gram in total by the time that they are mature. Then they enter this pre pupae stage, then they pupate, and then eventually they emerge as an adult again to fly, mate, and lay more eggs. So why, uh, yeah, that, that's the superstar, black soldier fly. Um, now I wanna wind back a little bit and talk about my story about why I was motivated to explore this species in the path of discovery that led me to finding it as the glaringly obvious answer at every turn. So I came about this as an attempt to look for a, like a lazier way to compost, to, to go about waste reduction. Um, I will give it away now. This is not a lazier way to go about uh, compost production or waste reduction or anything like that. But I still aim to, to address waste. Uh, my motivation um, to kind of close the loop on our nutrition and fertility cycle. Uh, it, that, that motivation really increased as I learned of some of the long-term consequences of our currently typically one-way fertility route. Um, this is not the place to get into it, but suffice it to say that sooner or later, uh, we'll be needing to reclaim phosphorus from the ocean. And so for me, these kind of fed into one another, wanting to address what Sorry, uh, wanting to address waste in general and wanting to, in particular, address some of our uh, nutrient losses. So that's where we find the benefits of this species. Um, first, it's just got a really simple and predictable life cycle. One of those things being it's incredibly easy to direct its over positioning. So like I said, the adults are, tr are looking for um, decaying organic material, but they don't land on it. They look for a um, very particular sized opening uh, at a certain distance from a certain kind of smell. Um, but this is relatively easy to direct, and so that makes it really easy. The females lay their eggs here, and then you can intervene and collect and distribute those eggs and apply them as you want. Um, and just in general, this makes it for, this is just one of many examples that um, this simple predictable life cycle make it easy for less labor intervention. Because, um, you know, remember I am, I'm trying to be lazy here. And so the more that I can just let the bug do what it's gonna do, the, the simpler my, uh, the rest of my process is. Um, and then the last thing, again, again letting, the, letting the insect do what it's, what it's there for is that they're just voracious omnivorous detri detritivores. Um, they eat essentially every kind of organic waste you can find. However, on an optimized diet, they can increase their weight gain over a hundred fold in just two weeks. Um, and then to kind of make a little call back to Gail's bit about biocontrol, rather than tritrophic or even uh, bitrophic, this is just a single trophic level. We have organic waste as the input and I am raising one species, just black soldier fly, uh, to do the entire process and to create the product. Um, now, when we're talking about waste management, the city is the best place to be located. Um, for one, um, we just have the economic possibility as waste management is often one of the leading bills that any municipality faces. But more immediate than this is just the sheer mass of organic waste which concentrates in a city. Um, from every single household to grocery stores to all the retail to the various retail food establishments, there's just so many produ people producing so much waste, and it's all within such a dense geographic region that there's um there's got to be some kind of possibility there, right? Like that's that's we're getting back to my original motivation. There's a lot of waste, and we've got to be able to do something with it. Um, and, and we're not talking small numbers. Food waste accounts for about one third of all global food production on this planet. So that's about a trillion dollars every year um, being wasted on food. That ratio, one third, it gets worse in the United States. About 40% of all food produced in the United States is wasted. That totals about $165 billion per year in this country. And so a lot of effort to produce this food that then just becomes a waste and a problem that we have to deal with. Um, and then on the other side of this, we're seeing ever rising food costs. Um, 
where, uh, which is also interesting because again, we're seeing it like in the city, we're seeing a bunch of food waste coming out of the city and the concentration of population. Most of the people, because it, uh, cities hold most of the people, most of the people um, facing these rising food costs are in the cities as well. Um, a large part of rising food costs has been in no, in no small part, the increasing costs for livestock feed, raising livestock because uh, people are wanting more meat, but meat is getting more expensive faster than demand is driving it. Um, livestock feed prices are raising about a 15% per year. It's a compound growth of 15%. Um, and most of that, about 70% of that uh, cost every, uh, every year is the protein. So um, whether we're talking livestock or not, um, protein fertility, when, when we're talking the, the food chain, it's the, the cost to produce protein is um, the crux of the expense. And so to me, this is where black soldier fly or your other preferred insect species really opens up the possibility for what I'm calling the urban rancher. Um, we could really redefine what it means to practice agriculture in the urban environment. Uh, we could bring in a livestock at the appropriate space and density for the modern city. So we're talking about the ability to not only produce protein in the city in a viable way, but actually in a way that outperforms even the best vegetable field or vegetable crops from rural farms. So um, by that I mean an optimized, excuse me, multi-layered, multi-level version of black soldier fly larvae production could yield between one to two million pounds of protein per acre per year that uh, compared to the top plant proteins, that's 4,200 times more than soy per acre, 7,800 times more than bean per acre. This means the urban farmer could be producing a million or more pounds of protein within a single warehouse. Uh, the small footprint, the simple life cycle, the proximity to copious volumes of organic waste means that these bugs could be cost competitive as a protein source against standards like soy or even fish meal without um, the, the, the downside of destroying the earth or its oceans along the way. Um, this urban rancher need not be at this scale. It's, um, um, I think one of the best things about this is that it's, uh, there's, it's very, there's low, very low barriers to entry, lots of entry scale options. Um, so I will talk about how I got started for next to no money in a second, but this is kind of what I see as like the first layer of starting to make money growing these grubs if you'd like. And essentially look to grow larvae for urban pets. Um, you are in a city, there's a vast amount of people there doing lots of interesting and sometimes weird things. Uh, in particular, I think um, pet poultry or chicken, you know, be, be it chickens or even exotic birds because things like um, peacocks have an even higher protein requirement than chickens do. Uh, so yeah, uh, exotic pets like fowl or things like hedgehogs or bearded dragons. Not many people have these pets, but when we are talking a city, um, the number of people with those pets increases dramatically and those, um, they ha these pets have fairly specialized diet. And I think this is where black soldier fly comes in um, where we could feed um, locally produced specialized uh, grubs for um, just local people who want a, uh, a feed stock that's, that's a step up from um, just soy meal. And so, um, like, like I said, the, the plasticity of black soldier fly larvae, I think um, the different levels that we can produce at with this grub are just wonderful. Um, so uh, at, the, at the home scale, like I said, we had some of those fresh things. We have fresh grubs um, and even dried grubs, if we'd like, you know, to make them store better. And that's, that's just all our entry, uh, really easy to start doing. Then if we want, we could step up, go past this bar here and shift into a little bit more industrial production, start talking about uh, machinery to make either ground grubs and turn it into meal or use a centrifuge to either separate out protein for either um, um, human consumption if we're there yet, but probably not. Otherwise, you know, like I said, for livestock feed, there's also the potential to spin out the lipids and create things like biofuels. Um, and then of course, even the, the chitin from these insects is not a waste. It can be industrially refined to a number of different products. And of course, again, as I said, kind of along this whole way, there is waste processing. At, at any and all of this scale, we are processing waste with these larvae. Um, and so uh, 
there's just a lot of opportunity to make a lot of different products and to continue to meet new customers, new markets along the way to continue to support yourself as you're growing for however large uh, you wish to go. And then you can more or less uh, stop as you'd like because there's the economy of scale comes to you quite quickly. Uh, okay, so now launching into uh, just my experience growing black soldier flies. So I started back in the summer of 2017, went for a little over two years before I had to um, shut it down to move. Um, I started with a 55 gallon drum, just put it on the sawhorses there. I got the drum for free off of Craigslist. I got the sawhorses for five bucks at the local Habitat for Humanity. And I got the space to put it by reaching out on Facebook to my local like, you know, Corvallis uh, area group and asking for space to do this. Just said, I want to try waste reclamation and see, you know, waste processing, see if I can do it. And someone offered me space in their yard. Uh, they were excited by the possibility. They liked my idea and they gave me the space. I occupied about eight square feet and was just putting my own food waste into this uh, 55 gallon drum. Um, Learned a lot of things along the way. Uh, most importantly, I was mismanaging the waste input. It's always an issue of too much water content. This structure broke apart and fell. It just, it, before it even filled up, it fell apart. It was so heavy. Um, it was quite the mess I had to clean up, but it moved me to this next place where I now have a, a different tactic. I have a business partner, we're at a new location and we have downsized from that 55 gallon drum uh, everything within it into this kind of more modular three gallon trays um, on, on a racking system. So we, we cut our uh, footprint in half. We're now on about four square feet and we're producing about a kilogram of larvae per week. Um, and we ran the numbers on this system that we did have. It should have at, at an optimal level, it should have been producing about 50 kilograms per week. So uh, why such a dismal disconnect? Um, because, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're suffering those issues, but as we turn and look at the popular press or everyone's talking about Black Soldier Fly as the promised land, um, small selection of these articles like Black Soldier Flies are the new superstars of sustainable aquaculture and the world's largest insect protein farm signals future of food supply. Someone has this figured out and uh, like, like there's, there's obviously some answers there that, that we hadn't quite gotten to and it's, it's not just as simple as grow the fly and, and it all works. Uh, some of those people who have figured it out or at least show promise in figuring out those answers, AgriProtein from South Africa um, raised $11 million investment back in 2015. Protex in the Netherlands uh, over $50 million in 2017, uh, 18 and a half million to Yensec in France. Um, all these people who are uh, um, showing great promise in, in actually turning this into a um, understood and defined process that is can be reliably, reliably reproduced because in the meantime, issues exist. Like I said, uh, we are concentrating a livestock. Um, we are going to face issues. These are mites on a black soldier fly adult. Obviously not good, um, just generally decreases the fitness of the population. Um, there's also just uh, regular or, or kind of Entry level issues of trying to trigger the flies mating cues. Most of the scholarly research has been focused on the of supplying the light, the right light to these flies. Um, but once you do this, you finally close the life cycle and make it to where the egg, or the adults are producing eggs and you stop having to buy in larvae. And so that's, that's the great first barrier to get past. Um, some things that still plagued us was slow neonate growth. So at the commercial grade, five day old larvae look about five millimeters long and they weigh about a hundredth of a gram. I, uh, we were hitting those marks in three times the time. It took us 15 days to hit this same level that, that, is, being, that is being reached at the commercial grade. Um, one of the things that we discovered about that was just the need for a special feed for the neonates. Um, so that was a, a, a fun little complication. Um, some of the other issues being there's a lot of mystery happening in the pupation. I think in general, we're just we're, we're seeing a lot of losses, which hints at issues with sanitation um, and also, of course, emergence. So I have this picture here. Um, wing development issues on the adults. So we have a well-formed wing here and a malformed wing here. This wing never fully expands. It never, re it never folds well onto the adult. And honestly, this was one of the better looking wings. A lot of them 
hardly ever even expand fully or, or, or don't even get one good wing. And so if the adults can't fly, they can't mate because that's what they fly to pair and then they land to mate. So if you have non-flying adults, um, you have a compromised mating system. And so your numbers just drop uh, very quickly. Uh, so um, that's uh, kind of my my spiel on Black Soldier Fly and why I think it's super appropriate. And there's uh, about a million more reasons I think it's the answer to our, our woes. But I think um, in general, as we see a growing urban population with the increasing density and the lack of space, we are seeing ever more uh, a push for high intensity production off of small footprints. And insects offer us an opportunity to produce livestock to produce protein in a way that simply cannot be done in a skyscraper type world, or at least um, not currently. And then of course, Gale showed the, the potential for producing biocontrol agents of uh, not only local ones, but also niche ones, um, particular for your crop or your pest or your region, or even simply just selling at a quantity approachable to you, giving you a pack of a thousand rather than 10,000 or something like that. And then um, lastly, I wrap this up, micro livestock. I think one of the best things about it for the urban agriculturalist, the urban grower, is that it is scalable. These insects reach, reach a great scale even, even at the small size. So even if you're starting with just a tub, of like a 35 gallon tub or 55 gallon tub or something like that, you can, you can have a successful system from there and you can continue to scale up and find um, outlets for your, for your products along the way, all the way up to um, you know, producing a million or two million pounds of protein within a, a city's warehouse. Um, so um, uh, in conclusion, we believe in urban agriculture, it just in general, it is the right time for urban agriculture. It is seeing increased attention and opportunity. In particular, we've seen, you know, in this recent pandemic and the most recent disruptions to global food distributions, as we see every time, um, um, the global economy gets unsettled, people turn to local food distributions for security. And um, there's been a real uptick uh, most recently as well. And um, I, think, I think insects uh, pose one of the uh, great potentials uh, to continue to expand and, and go beyond uh, simple urban gardens. Um, it's also the right time because the USDA's investment in urban agriculture has finally started to kick in. So the farm bill back from 2018 has finally begun paying out the urban ag specific part of the program. Um, and that's a little bit where Gail and I come in. So we run OSU's urban agricultural certificate program. It's the first undergraduate certificate program in the United States. We address topics of simple production, economic barriers, issues of social justice. Um, so far, we have six core courses and 20 to 20 elective courses in our program. Uh, we also offer a handful of non-credit uh, public courses. And really, uh, to kind of round off where we're at in this urban ag program right now, uh, just a thank you to you all here at Purdue for um, inviting this talk on insect husbandry. It's kind of really um, the the validation we were looking for and hoping for to pursue this uh, topic in general and to potentially be crafting this as a course to offer to the students and as part of our urban agricultural certificate program. So uh, thank you all for your attention. And I think we still have some time for questions. Um, we do. Thank will... you, Michael. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Gail. Um... That was really interesting and exciting to hear from like-minded individuals um, as we work and develop our urban ag programs here at Purdue as well. Um, so we do have one question currently in the chat and I would just remind all of our participants that you can um, raise your hand, unmute yourself or type a question in the chat. But the first one comes from um, my graduate student who is working on black soldier flies. And she says, I have wing curling in some of the adults I have currently emerging. How can I try and combat that? It's only recently started happening. Okay, well, so the scientist in me picked up on it's only recent. That's awesome. What were you doing before and what changed? Um, I don't have an answer. Um, it, I think there is a lot more happening with humidity than anyone is talking about. 
I am battling humidity. I am battling moisture content. The, the, the food waste is almost always like 50% water when I'm getting it, whether it be actual you know, kitchen, kitchen waste or spent brewer grains or something like that. It's, it's so wet and I'm just driving that water out of there, trying not to kill larvae, trying not to drown them. However, when you switch to that pupation, it seems to get touchy. And I think that having the pupation area too dry has um, um, contributed to issues during the pupation process because um, I don't know, it's difficult, it's weird um, because you can't see inside it, right? <laughs> um, so you're just like, you have the pupa and you wait and then you watch how they're all messed up and you just, you know, run a new trial. Um, but yeah, I, I, th I think it's something to do with humidity. That's kind of one of the points that I'm trying to press down on it and, and get more detailed. Awesome, thank you. We have a second question that's come in that says, at what range of temperature are black soldier flies active? Um, okay, so we can kind of run off of like seeing that they've established themselves in the tropics. They really do like it warm. I don't, so the, I, I guess there's two parts of the life cycle as well. There's adults and there's the grubs. The adults really are only barely kind of moving at maybe 60 Fahrenheit. And they really, they really start liking it up around 80, um, which depending on where you are can be quite difficult. Like um, here running it through the, it, I feel like I figured out how to keep them cool enough through summer as soon as winter hit and now I'm suddenly supplying heat instead. Um, on the other side, the larvae, they're, they like it also quite hot, like very hot, um, 100 Fahrenheit or possibly more, um, but they also, they create their own heat. They are so voracious. Their metabolism is high. Uh, if it weren't for adults, I wouldn't have needed to heat my my area through the winter because the larvae are just fine. They're just they're chugging along. And let in less than until it got really cold. Um, they were in a horse barn, so it was not insulated. It was not. Uh, the room was not heated, and so they they managed themselves until it got down below freezing and then I actually finally saw them kind of stop um, but then they kicked back up uh, in the heat of the next day. Awesome thank you Michael. Um, Gail I wanted to ask while we wait for a, a few more questions about the um, the beekeeping uh, with osmia and sort of how with the increase in popularity of people having bee houses in their yards, how has that changed your message or how do you educate them about management of pathogens and parasites? And, and do you find that people are actively managing them or kind of giving up on these houses once they recognize the challenges? Yeah, so the management of um, pathogens and parasites on the mason bee cocoons, we're actually really lucky that we have master gardener groups that have totally embraced this message. Um, the Lynn County master gardeners like that, they've just taken that as like their project and it's grown across the state where now they have protocols. And like I mentioned, they have cleaning parties they have Mason Bee office hours. Um, and so by having this really dedicated network of volunteers who truly love pollinators and Mason Bees in particular, they've been able to take a lot of the, the messaging coming from our pollinator health extension specialist and making sure that um, folks who are new to Mason Bee rearing have access to that information and support for when things go wrong. Wonderful. We got a question in relation to this scale in the um, Q&A box. Um, Greg asks, if I create some mason bee nests, can I assume these bees will find them? Are the introduced mason bee species in the Midwest? Um, I am fairly sure that the introduced species are in the Midwest, but I have not looked at the Discover Life maps lately to see how far they're spread. Um, if you put the houses up, can you be sure that mason bees will find them? No, 
uh, a lot of times we have folks who will buy mason bee houses at like a local bird store, local garden store, and they're totally disappointed that no mason bees ever come. Uh, the system that most people have in place to ensure mason bee um, colonization of the tubes that you're putting out is they actually put, it's a system where you buy the mason bee house and the cocoons and you basically put the cocoons um, in close proximity to the, the mason bee nesting blocks to uh, promote colonization. Thank you so much, Michael and Gail. Um, it was it was a really great seminar and I look forward to having some more conversations about all the different aspects that you presented on today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, see some of you uh, soon. Thank you. Bye now.